All right. Acts chapter 9, very familiar verses of Scripture. In fact, I uh, have preached on this not uh, too long ago, but I could not get away from it, so we try to be obedient unto the Lord. Acts chapter 9, in the first verse, the Bible says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he, found, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined, a, there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And then, and then the men journeyed and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him unto, into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street that is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And have seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming and he putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how, e how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And, there, and, he, and here he have authority from the chief priests to bind all that call upon his name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I will shew him how much great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word. Lord, we pray that you would always help us to recognize it as the very word of God and not simply words written on a page by an historian but by the very word of God and how it should guide us and it should lead us and take us always closer to you. God, we pray this morning that you would open the hearts of those that are here this morning, that you would draw the believers closer unto yourself and that you would open the dark heart of the lost according to your mercy and grace, we pray it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, very familiar verses of Scripture, the calling of Paul, uh, to salvation and the calling of Paul to the apostolic ministry and the things that must occur after this is done. And our thought this morning would be it's not always smooth sailing. And we'll see that from the life, life of Paul that he did not have an easy ministry, but he had an effective ministry. Yeah. Now, we have three young preacher boys with us this morning, and that's my news for you. It's not going to be smooth sailing. You're going to have difficult times. But let me remind you of this. The great is your reward if you stick to the stuff. Uh, Time and time again, Paul suffered hardship, difficulties, and yet and still, by the grace of God, he never gave up. And that's what should be our, uh, our commitment, not only preachers, but as just uh, true believers as well, don't give up. 
God. Listen, we live in a day and age where the, the move of our government here in the United States is for us to throw in the towel to say, well, we're done. There's nothing left to do. Well, dear friend, until we're gone, the Bible gives us a commission and we are always to spread the gospel and never, ever stop. And so we see that this amazing event happens in the life of Paul. Now, the only thing that I see directly uh, a little bit different than redemption is this, is that he did see the Lord in the flesh. And that made him an apostle. It made him apostolic. It made him to have a ministry different than mine and yours. <clears throat> Seeing the Lord Jesus in the flesh. Now, that's an unusual experience, and that's why the apostolic debt, uh, uh, the apostolic office is dead, irregardless of what people are saying this uh, today. That is not an active office in a true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first verse, I want you to see that Paul, Saul, was not seeking Christ. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible says very clearly, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. But I do want you to see this. Paul wasn't doing that. Uh, he wasn't, uh, if anything, his interest was to take the ministry down. Uh, you know, and, and that shows the depravity of man completely. In, of all, in and of ourselves, we cannot seek Christ. If you have that desire, this morning, you, you, you've never known the forgiveness of sin and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet and still you have a desire to know Him. That's not an inbuilt desire. It's desire granted by grace. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't happen just because we want it to. That really is what sets us aside from the Armenians is that there's nothing in this flesh whatsoever that desires the person of Christ, ever. And, and so we see that that was Paul's condition, as yet and still he was not a saved individual. He wanted authority, he wanted governmental authority to go down and break up the church uh, at Damascus. Now, as an aside, because we've been criticized a little bit uh, lately of taking alien immersion or whatever you want to call it, I want you to see there's no historic record of anybody in Jerusalem ever going down there and starting a mission to start with, right? Uh, we have to trust they were sound believers because Paul hooked up with them, and I don't believe he would have if he, there weren't a true group, but yet and still you don't find a genealogy back to Jerusalem, do you? And, and so we find that uh, he was on his way not to join the church, but to destroy the church. That was his that was his focus. Also, I want you to see that he got authority from the elders to break the church up. Now, why that is significant, that very same bunch had the authority to release Christ. You remember that? Mm -hmm. They didn't do it, but I want you to see they had authority when they wanted it, and when they didn't want it, they cast it aside. Uh, that, that's just about as common as you can get, isn't it? They had the authority to release Jesus, but they would not because they hated Christ, and they hated Christ's ministry. And so we find this is the very same group of individuals that Paul saw authority from. Verse 4, and he, uh, verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, almost to his goal, ready to break up the church, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. Now, isn't it a glorious, wonderful thing when suddenly Christ intervenes? What a glorious thing. Now, uh, all of you know, I guess, most of you know, maybe, uh, I don't think, that, uh, I don't know, uh, Brother Lawley's heard my testimony. I was saved in a free will church. But the only good thing about it, it had free will right across the door. They weren't ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, But when the Lord spoke to me, it was very closely on this wise because I'd heard the gospel my whole life. I, I truly don't even remember the first time I was inside a church. Uh, I, I was taken as a baby from the time I was a baby on up. And I, but you know what? The gospel never did mean nothing to me. 
Yeah. It was empty words on the page that meant nothing and, and, and didn't draw me unto Christ. But one day, blessed be the name of the Lord, it did, and the Lord saved my never dying soul. That's a gift of God. It's not, it's not under the conquest of man because man hates it. And, and so we find that Paul has this very singular experience on the road to Damascus, no desire of God, and the Lord Jesus steps in and says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you putting me down? Why are you trying to drag down the gospel? Why are you persecuting me? What a wonderful, wonderful day. I want you to see it wasn't flowers and roses when he called him, was it? He made him guilty before God. He said, you are my person. You know what the gospel will do first? It will make you guilty before God. Because before that, you, you don't care nothing about redemption because you think you're A-OK. -okay. Yeah. Paul, Paul was a Jew among Jews, just like Brother Junior said this morning. He was, he was, he was top stuff. But you know what he had? He had religion. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have redemption. Mm -hmm. I, I fear today among our five points or Baptists that that's a lot of what we have, don't you? How, how could we not believe anything else when you come to a church, you come to a service and it's dry, it's gunpowder. Why? Because it lacks the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. right? right? And the only thing I can come to in that Either the preaching is flawed or the people are flawed. Because see, when you got the two working together, the Holy Spirit will show up. You find that again and again and again uh, through the ministry of Paul. And, and so we find that God intervenes and blessed be His name for doing so. Thank the Lord God that He intervened on my behalf and He stops the show. And he stops the process down toward uh, down, down toward Damascus and says, hang on, why are you persecuting me? Now notice what He says. And He said, who art thou, Lord? He knew who He was. Uh, you know what? When the Holy Ghost comes your way and makes you aware of your nature, you won't have to ask who showed up. Because again, that's a revealed truth. That's not something that you read in empty words on the page, is it? I mean, that's a blessed book. But you know what it is to lost people? It's a book. <laughs> you know what it is to the redeemed? The precious Word of God. That is the difference. And, and, and so we find that... Uh, <laughs> He stops, him, he stops him in his tracks and, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? He understood the person of Christ. Now notice what also he, also he says, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now a prick is a, a golden, a, a golding, not a golden, a golding, G-O-A-D-I-N-G, -G, that you guide an animal with. And in our country, they're often put on a boot and cowboys use them to steer their horse. They, they get golden. And that's what he says this. <laughs> you've, been, you've been rebuking this thing. Now you're not going to change the mind of God. But what did, Mo what did Moses do with the angel of God? Uh, I mean, the night before they were delivered. He fought with the devil, didn't he? And, or, I'm sure he, thought he fought with God. And God reached down and touched him, throwed his hip out of joint, mm. and he was that way the rest of his life. Mm. See, people do fight with the Almighty. Now, let me say this, you're always going to lose. <laughs> Right? Right. But you know, that don't change our nature any, does it? Even in after redeeming, do you ever fight against the will of God? I do. Mm -hmm. I think you'd be lying if you if you told me you didn't, because you know what? You have a nature that is just as wicked as, as the most vile persons in hell. Right. That's right. And you and, and you will fight against the will of the Almighty. And so we find that Paul is redeemed and apparently from this, God had been kicking him for a little while and Paul wouldn't do nothing. Paul, Paul, there was no response. Why? Because Paul was dead in his sins. 
Verse 6, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now, that is a wonderful, wonderful state of mankind, of women, of the redeemed, the elect. When you get down, say, oh, Lord, what would you have me to do? Give me some direction. Take me to the place that you'd have me to go. Let, uh, whatever it is, if I'm going to sweep up the floor at church, if I'm going to bake for the people there, or if I'm going to preach the gospel, you give me something to do. Uh, a very, very common to what Elijah had that day there in the temple in chapter 6, wasn't it? They came out with the same, the exact same words, did they not? See, you, you know why it's so dry and you don't see missionaries going? That's why. Because mm -hmm. nobody gets to that point. Lord, what would you have me to do? You know what? How old was Moses when he said, I want you to go down there and tell Pharaoh to let my people go? He was at 80. And you know what? That was a 40 year job. Yeah. And, and, and God preserved his flesh according to what I understand. It was like a, a normal man when, whenever God, God took his life. But you know what? He had no guarantee of that. He was going out on faith. So the issue today really is faith, is it not? You know, Brother Junior was just talking about that. Do you have enough faith that you think God is able? Do you have enough faith that he called you to the backside of the desert that's where you would go? You think of the, the horrible uh, situation in the Middle East, even now, would you want to go? Nobody would want to go in their flesh. The question is, would you go? And, and, and so we see that Paul had this amazing experience uh, he heard the audible voice of God, and we'll see in a minute that he's seen the Lord Jesus Christ actually visually, all over this account does not, not include that. We'll read another account when Paul's giving his testimony that did include that. But I want you to see that this is what made him an apostle, a willingness to go. Verse 6, uh, and the Lord said, verse 6, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must. Do. In other words, it's not optional. We, we, we like optional things today, do we not? Well, I can go if I want to. Well, I don't believe that's much gospel work, do you? Uh, uh, I go because he made me go. I, I go because he, that he geared me in that direction. Listen, it's not a profession. I'm a registered nurse. That's my profession. Uh, preaching the gospel is my call. Uh, I, I go out and take care of old people every day so there'll be some food on the table when I get home. You see what I'm saying? That's a totally different thing. That's not a ministry. A ministry is doing what God would have you to do. That is effective ministry. And, and so we find that that's exactly where we ought to be, and that's exactly what Paul came to. Now, we have this intervention with Ananias. Uh, uh, an instance of effective prayer. I've never heard the Lord Jesus audibly, but he's talked to me as clear as this is. I certainly knew what his will was for my life. And he said, Ananias, I want you to go give some, uh, some authorized baptism to an individual that I know. And I want you to go down there and get the job done. And he very willingly went. Verse 16. For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. No option. You know, you think about all the life events of Paul. Everything that he endured. One that sticks out in my mind is all you know, and my family particularly, I cannot stand snakes. They literally make me sick to my stomach. But do you remember... He, uh, after the shipwreck, Paul ended up on this tiny island and there was nothing there but heathen people, people that didn't even know God. And he was building up a fire so they could get warm. And there was a, a viper there in it. And it, it caught on to him and he just swung it off back into the fire. And no hurt came upon him. See, that's a man that is following the will of God. See, what the world calls is judgment. When you're, when you're with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're above that. You know, I fully believe this, and supposedly, um, 
delta variant or whatever they call them. If you got a D when I was in school, that was statement, right? Uh, but the delta variant is out there. And listen, they're going to try to shut us down. And y'all might be coming and, and, and bringing me something to eat down at the jail, even so be it. Because I'll find myself in the will of the Almighty. And so he says, I'm going to show you that you are going to suffer. Preachers, you are going to suffer. Uh, they're not going to be running the aisles most of the time. They are not going to be hugging your neck. If anything, they'll be running you off. Right? And, and so we as the Lord's people need to remember that, that the perfect will foreordained by God for Paul was that he was going to suffer. There were going to be difficulties. Time, and you know, when he's giving his testimony, I think in the second letter to Corinth, he said, thrice I have been stoned. Remember that one place it says they'd already give him up for dead and he, and he woke and he, he, rise, he rose back up? Listen, that's no fairy tale. That happened. Now, have you ever uh, have you ever been hit by a stone? I haven't, but I'll, I'll tell you a story of when I was in elementary school. Now, uh, I loved W. T. Thomas School. It was very tiny, about sixty-seven students, K through eight. Just a little bitty school. We loved it, but we had some wild kids down there. And uh, there was this girl named Dina, Dina Brown, and she was wild. She was uh, she. She, she was right on line, I don't think she is anymore, but she was right on line in truth. She's the first girl that I ever knew, her and Dana Baggett, that wore dresses all the time. And it caught my attention even then as a boy. And uh, uh, she had this bag of rocks that she collected off the playground, and she was swinging it around like this, and she, brought, she let go of it. And all y'all remember Jeff Moore, who was a charter member here? He, she hit Jeff right here. I mean, his head just busted open. And, uh, it, 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 I mean, crazy, crazy bleeding. But you know what? Apparently that was predestined and foreordained. Apparently that was the will of God that he would be slapped in the head with a, a bag of rocks. Now, I don't know why it happened that way, but I will tell you this. You know how Jeff always wore his bangs like, down like this? That's why. He's a big star right here. See, uh, Everything happens. Everything happens for the good of God's people. Now, we quote that from Romans 8. We don't know all things. Now, we don't always think about all, do we? But all certainly means all. Mm -hmm. What about having a baby that literally was born with cancer? You're looking at one. All things. Was there, there a, was there a reason behind it? Oh, certainly. How I, here I am, 50, almost 53 years later. Do I understand it? No, I don't understand it any better than I did then. But I believe it. Right? All things. So when we hear all, don't think about the check coming through the mail. Think about getting hit in the head with the back rocks. Because all things means all things. And so we as the Lord's people uh, need to be like Paul. And remember, when the going gets rough, God is still in it. He's in the very middle of what needs to be done. Acts chapter 26. Acts 26. Beginning... In verse 9, Acts 26, and verse 9, the Bible says this, I verily or truly thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see, first of all, he thought. He was, he was not regenerate, so he thought he was doing God a service. Verse 10 which thing I also did in Jerusalem, which means he messed with the church, the first church there in Jerusalem, and many of the saints, and I think it's interesting he uses that word, he now knew they were redeemed, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison. And the chief priest, when they were put to death, 
I made my voice against them. In other words, he testified against them. Yeah, they ought to die. And I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things in this verse that we'll miss. Uh, I want you to see that they that Paul compelled them to blaspheme. Now, what does that mean? He wanted them to deny Christ. That's blasphemy. Now, how many people have you have read the Martyr's Mirror or the Fox's Book of Martyrs? Mm -hmm. What they always do, Jerry? Give them an opportunity to deny Christ. Life for life, right? You know what? Almost a hundred percent of them did. They chose to die. That 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 is a that is a salvation experience to take you to a grave one way or the other. Right? And so we find that that's exactly the type of redemption he had. But I want you to see his behavior in no way was likened to one that was seeking Christ. But that rather he hated the people of God. Verse 12, whereupon I went to Damascus with authority and commission, the authorization of the government from the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw in the, light, in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. Now, you know what? I've never seen, <laughs> I've never literally seen the light, but I remember when he spoke to me. Mm -hmm. And you know what a light does? It illuminates things, right? It, it makes you see things that were in darkness to you. It, it makes you see things that, that are a threat to you that wasn't there before. Right. And you see yourself for what you really are. Now, not everybody's going to... I'll say this. Everybody that really has a spiritual life, they'll respond to it. But some people see things in an earthly sense and read this book like you do a textbook and they'll see the problems but you know what they won't address them that's the difference remember the story i think it's in the old testament and it talks about a man looking into a looking glass and he's got he's got food in his mouth but he don't wipe it he just goes away ignoring his condition listen dear friend that's probably 99 percent of people that hear the gospel they walk away with still something on their face. Preacher boys, don't be discouraged about that. That's not your category. Right. You just preach the gospel. Right. And, 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 and walk away from it. And so we find then that Paul had no interest in the things of God. And he was going there. But all of a sudden light shined around. And he saw things differently in a wonderful, wonderful way. And in a wonderful day when, when the light turned on. And you began to see things in a different way. And in a totally different manner than you saw them before. You began to see your inability without Christ. Listen, church, that is a God-revealed truth. And it did not come by your own logic. Right. At midday, O King, I saw in the way. <laughs> Any wonderful thing when, when Christ gets in the way. Uh, Balaam Mass had more spiritual sense than Balaam did, didn't he? <laughs> he saw, she saw that angel <laughs> when he didn't even see it. <laughs> and uh, I think we all get that way at times. At midday, O King. I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them that journeyed with me. And we were all fallen to the earth. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, uh, an effectual call, a specific call, uh, uh, a call to one person, saying unto me in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why uh, persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The very testimony that he had when it really happened, he was still sharing, and the best I understand, this was probably 12 years later, still sharing the one wonderful truth of the Word of God. Oh, I love it when He interrupts my plan, don't you? When, when I think I've got all of the, the pieces in a row, and just like when you knock down dominoes, He comes and does like this. Because He's got a plan. 
he, he, he's got something far, far better than I do. Verse 15, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But, uh, but rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness of both things which thou hast seen, and of those things which will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto, unto whom I now send thee. Now, one thing I want you to see that Paul did not include in this, and it was his business, I don't have uh, any reason to understand why he didn't, but that the fact that he became blind. Now, why was that? For three days he didn't see at all, and even after it cleared up some, he was never the same again. Isn't it a wonderful thing that you could spend just that much time with Christ and never be the same again? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I want to be, is it you? I, I want to be that individual that sees him one time and totally changed for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Now, those days that he couldn't see at all, said that he didn't even eat and drink. You know what me and Brother Junior was talking about this right before church time, how that true fasting will break this body down enough that, that spirituality becomes what's important. That's the purpose of fasting. Uh, obedience and, and certainly do you have a mind to get closer into Christ. And, and when you do that, it will. And so, so he, he had this horrible blindness. And then when it popped back in, it wasn't, you know what, we need a blindness to this world. Uh, Thank you bad. But listen, if we get so focused on that, we'll lose our focus on Christ. We don't need, we need to be blinded to this world. Why do we put blinders on the horse? So they won't be distracted by all this junk around them and they'll keep a straight shot where they're supposed to go. The very same thing with us. Uh, when you get caught up in the world, and I know I harp on separation every service, and that's okay. But the, the goal of separation is this, that you can keep your mind in Christ. It's just not how long your dress is. It's that you might keep your mind in Christ. Right? Keep focused on Him. We, we live in a horrible day, but we can still focus on Christ. Um, everybody knows uh, Fanny Crosby. We sang one of her hymns this morning. She's born with the ability to see. She, at six weeks old, had an infection in uh, her eye. And most babies go through that. Every one of mine had some kind of infection at one time or another. And you put the drops in and you rub them at the corners and pray for the best, right? But Fanny's family came into contact with a charlatan that said he was a physician and he wasn't. And he, did, he dumped chemicals in her eye that made her blind the rest of her life. Now, all things work together. Have you ever seen a blind child? I've seen a few. It's very beautiful to watch. We were talking about blind people the other day and how those that become musicians often do this when they're playing. The reason they do that, they're not going along with their, their play. They're trying to find their balance. That's one of the huge things about blind people most people don't know is they have no center of balance, really. And so they often do like this. Uh, my sister-in-law, Christopher's wife, y'all remember when she used to care for that little blind girl? And she brought her to a family function, and I noticed she was always doing like this. She's trying to find a balance. Now, for me, that's the most precious thing right here. My hearing is bad, and if it goes, listen, I'll hate it. But I'll be honest, I'd rather these to go than these to go. Yeah. And, uh, but Fanny Crosby lived her whole life that way. 
And so endeared unto the Lord by the end of her life, she says, if I could get it back today, I would not take it. Because I want the first thing to see is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. that, that's a powerful testimony, is it not? And I don't think she was just blowing words either. I think she meant it. No. So we need to be the same way. Listen, it's a, it's a rough time to live. So we need to keep our eyes on Christ. And you know the rest of the story, the testimony of Paul. He sent a number of church letters that are now bound into our, our New Testament and we get to enjoy them Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. But do you know how his life ended? He ended up on the chocolate block. Right? And uh, he lost his hand. And you know, I fully believe this to the last moment. There were no regrets. I think he anxiously awaited as soon as the chop fell to see his Lord Jesus Christ. That's uh, that's where I want to be. But I won't I won't get to that place of servitude just playing church. I won't get to that place of servitude pretending to be a preacher. I won't get to that place. And you won't either without a, a genuine, effective, effectual call. This, this Armenian junk has, has filled church houses full of lost people, and I have no doubt that was the devil's plan for it. But I want something where he spoke to me, to the person of the Holy Ghost. I want something more than will you repeat this prayer. I want something that's so sure when I lay my head down at night and the flood waters are coming up, that I can say, I can sleep just as peaceful as I ever had before. That is the real difference, is it not? You know what? Things are going to get worse. If we get President Trump back, you know what? Things are going to get worse. Right. Right. Uh, so what do you have to hold on to this morning? I'll tell you what I have to hold on to is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to me one day and he, he turned my sins to a place I don't even know of. And if they are brought up, you know who brings them up? Me. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Cast them to the sea of forgetfulness. Stand before the Almighty one day and they, they're so obscured by the blood of Christ even the Almighty God of all heaven won't see them. That's amazing, is it not? That's where I want to be. Dear friend, if you're saved, rejoice with me. If you're lost, look for a Damascus Road experience. Look for, look for experience like Lydia, so sweet and simple, whose heart the Lord opened. I believe without experiences like that, dear friend, you're still lost. I don't care what prayer you said. I don't care if you followed in scriptural baptism. I really don't. Do you know Christ? This yeah. Amen. That, that's all that matters. Yeah. When, when we're done and said, and they bury me out here in the boneyard, what else matters? What else matters? A sinner saved by grace. That, that, that will sum up my life very quickly and very truly. Four simple words. Yeah.